Hello everyone, welcome to this week's lab. Um, or this week, um, lab's a little different um, since this is coming through exam week. Um, we'll just be focused on studying for the exam. So going, reviewing exam topics for this week. Um, okay, uh, some reminders before we get started. Um, so remember to check Canvas for any official due dates and times. But for this week, since again, this is exam week, um, you know, there's not much stuff you have to worry about in terms of turning stuff in, so there won't be any pre-lab this week. The next pre-lab won't be due until the Monday after the exam, so Monday, April 6th. Um, there won't be any homework you have to worry about. There's no lab wrap-up quiz, as this is a completely optional lab. Um, there's no MRite. MRite's all done, so there's not really anything you guys need to turn in this week. So it's kind of more um, for you guys to focus on studying for the exam. Um, so more about the exam, exam two. So it'll be this um, Thursday, April 2nd, and it'll start at 6 p.m. and go until 7.45 p.m. And again, this is Eastern Daylight Time, so Michigan time, East Coast time. Um, so the exam will end up being administered via course.work. So just like how you guys have work, been working on your homework throughout this semester, it'll be a similar format. Um, so the exam is going to be an hour and 45 minutes instead of the usual hour and a half. And this is just to give us a little extra buffer time in case of any technical issues, given a new format to kind of get used to. So will give you a little extra buffer time for that. Um, there will be, if not, if there's not already, there will be a practice exam up soon on Courseworks. And, and this will be the same format and style as a real exam. So I highly recommend you go through that to kind of get a feel of how this exam is going to run. Um, there will be additional practice problems posted on Canvas as well. Um, so if you want any more details, make sure that you check um, the Friday Focus page. That's really helpful each week to show you all the information that you need. Um, again, more about the exam time. So it'll be starting at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, Eastern Daylight Time. And so um, given um, in the contiguous United States, this will be the times that will start for you guys. So say, for example, if we're um, sitting in Chicago or in... Oklahoma City or in anywhere in Texas, that's all central time, so the exam will start at 5 for you. If you're in the mountain time zone, um, so if you're in like Denver, then it'll probably start at 4 p.m. Or if you're in the Pacific time and also Arizona, since Arizona doesn't do daylight savings time. So anywhere on the west coast as well as Arizona, it'll start at 3 p.m. for you guys. Um, so if there are any conflicts with the times, um, including those that are not in the U.S. anymore, if you're out of the country, um, there will be an exam conflict form that you guys can fill out. Um, this is provided. It should be on Canvas, or it should also be given within the announcement email for the Friday Focus, so you should be able to look somewhere for that. Um, so going over, again, helpful study material for exam two. Um, so some things to look over, supplement one, as well as worksheets one and two. Remember, these are all in our lab workbook, um, given the pages here. So both supplement one and worksheet one kind of go over all of our interpretations that we've gone over. So that's good to look at that. And worksheet two, it goes over assumptions for all the tests that we've done so far. So that's really helpful in getting all these assumptions for all the different tests. Knowing all those, that will be helpful. Um, name that scenario um, through eCoach. That's a really helpful tool, knowing what, so given a certain problem, can you tell me what type of test we need to, to run for it? So if it's like a one proportion, one mean, two mean type test, name that scenario is really helpful for that. Um, as well as going through problem roulette. Um, so they, these are just past exam problems, so those will be really helpful to go over. Make sure if you do that to just select topics five through nine to be relevant as well as going over the homeworks is really helpful as well, both required and recommended. So any um, of the homeworks four through eight will be helpful. Um, so if you also end up working on worksheets one and two, um, those solutions should be posted on Canvas real soon as well. Um, and again, and since we've gone over a bunch of interpretations and definitions so far, um, it will be really helpful to remember all these for exam two. So here's a list of all the interpretations we've gone over so far. So standard deviation, standard error, test statistic, p-value, confidence interval and level, decisions, conclusions, type one, type two error and power. So can we interpret all these terms and all of our scenarios that we've gone over so far? Remember all the tools that we could use to go over this it will be really helpful. 
All right, so again, lab today. Um, so this is just going over um, some problems that could be relevant for the exam. So we'll, we'll work through a lab review questions to practice concepts from exam two, as well as a certain lab ticket that goes over more review questions for exam two. So it's just really helpful for review. Um, and also remember, there is no Canvas quiz for this week. This is just extra review um, to reinforce all these concepts for you. So don't worry about trying to do a quiz to get points or anything. You're all set for that this week. Um, so the solutions to the lab questions and ticket will be posted to Canvas as well. So um, after we go through them, you can always look through them yourself as well. And after watching this recording, um, if you have any questions, make sure um, those to attend one of the live stream labs as well. We can always go there and ask any questions about any of this material. All right, so let's get started with our lab review questions. Make sure you have the sheet open on your computer or have it printed out to work on. Um, we'll go over those questions right now. And so we'll look at the first question. So according to Walmart, checkout times for their customers is uniformly distributed between 4 and 11 minutes. This distribution has a mean of 7.5 minutes and a standard deviation of 2.02 minutes. You are given the following graphs and are asked to match them with the scenarios below. So we have these four different graphs, one uniform, two normal, and one T distribution. Let's match them to these scenarios. So looking at our first scenario, we have an intern working at Walmart is asked to calculate the probability that a randomly selected Walmart customer will have a checkout time longer than 10 minutes. Which distribution, A, B, C, or D, should the intern use to calculate this probability and also briefly explain why? So pause the video, think about this, work through it, and when you're ready, we'll go over it. All right. Um, so for this problem, we would say that the intern should use distribution A. So for this, um, we want to find the probability for an individual observation. So that means that we should use the distribution for our individual checkout times, which this was what was originally described within our problem. So we had that, that original distribution of our checkout times was uniform between 4 and 11 minutes. So graph A fits that description. Uh, so let's take a look at the second scenario. So a second intern working at Walmart has been given the task to take a random sample of 36 customers, record each checkout time, and compute the average of these 36 checkout times. So which distribution out of the four should the intern use to calculate the probability that this average checkout time is longer than eight minutes? So again, think about it. We'll discuss in a second. All right, so for this one, we would say that the intern should use distribution C. So again, to find the probability for a sample average, they want to find a distribution of possible sample mean values. So creating a distribution of sample means, so that should sound similar to the, the definition of the central limit theorem, right? So once we want to apply, once we know we want to apply the CLT, we can look at that definition. So if X follows any distribution, with a known mean and standard deviation. And we also have that large enough sample size, which um, namely is greater than 25, which checks out in our case since we have 36 greater than 25. So since we have all this, then we can say that our sample mean, um, samples means will be normally distributed um, with our mean and standard deviation given as such. So we can go ahead and convert those. So our original mean of 7.5 will stay as such. And then our new standard deviation, we can say we can put in our original standard deviation of 2.02, divide that by the square root of our sample size of 36, and that should get us a standard deviation of about one third. So now that we know that our standard deviation is about one third, um, you can see that that matches what is given in graph C. So this should be our distribution we use. All right, now let's take a look at this third scenario. So a third intern working at Walmart has been given the task to assess if the average checkout time at Kroger is significantly greater than Walmart's 7.5 minute average. They take a random sample of 36 Kroger customers, record each checkout time, and find the average checkout time for these 36 Kroger, Kroger customers is 8.5 minutes. Assuming the true average checkout time at Kroger is 7.5, which distribution should the intern use to calculate the probability that this average checkout time for Kroger customers is longer than 8.5? So 
So again, think about it. We'll discuss in a sec. All right, so for this one, we would say that the intern should use distribution D. So for this, we could see that a certain hypothesis test is being run. We can namely see that this test, we could name our null hypothesis. We're seeing if this mu is just equal to 7.5 versus our alternative. We're trying to see if our certain population mean in this case is greater than the original 7.5 minutes. Um, and we would want to say if the intern is trying to calculate the p-value of an observed sample mean of 8.5. Here, the population standard deviation is unknown. So because of that, we would want to use the t-distribution with um, n minus 1 degrees of freedom being used for that. So again, um, the difference um, using that t-distribution, since we don't have that population standard deviation, um, that would be the reason why we use that t. All right, now let's take a look at this last part. So we have, suppose the second intern will be short on time to complete the project and determines he'll only be able to take a random sample of nine Walmart customers. So select the appropriate answers for how the distribution of the sample mean checkout time for n equal to nine will compare to the distribution of the sample mean checkout time for n equal to 36 in our part B that we have. All right, so now let's take a look at these certain statements. So the mean of the distribution for n equal 9 would increase, decrease, or stay the same as compared to our n equal 36. So think about it. So for this, we would say that the mean of this distribution should stay the same. So remember, going back to part B, we were saying that this would utilize the central limit theorem. So looking at that central limit theorem, we see that the mean of this sampling distribution of x bar is given just as our original mu. So this isn't affected by the sample size at all. So the mean should just stay the same in either case. All right, so let's take a look at the second statement. The standard deviation of the distribution for n equal 9 would increase, decrease, or stay the same as compared to n equal 36. So for this one, we should say that the standard deviation would increase given this smaller size. So again, remembering that we're applying the CLT, the standard deviation for this distribution is given as our original standard deviation over that square root of n. So we see that this is actually that this is actually affected by our sample size. So as we have a smaller n, we would see that this actually increases our resulting final standard deviation. Since our n is in the denominator, as our denominator gets smaller, our whole number should get bigger, right? So since we're working with a smaller n, that should give us a bigger standard deviation. Now let's take a look at this last statement. The shape of the distribution for n equal to 9 would either change or stay the same as compared to n equal 36. So this one, we would say that this should change. So since, we're, again, we're using the central limit theorem, um, if we decreased our sample size to 9, we would actually say that we can't use the central limit theorem in that case. Since, remember, part of the definition of the central limit theorem is that we need a large sample size, namely that that sample size is greater than or equal to 25. So then for our original sample size of 36, we could say by this definition that it would be approximately normal but we don't know that for sure for our n equal to 9. So we, wouldn't, so we would say that this shape wouldn't be the same, that it should change. All right, so let's take a look at problem number two. So we have a school district was interested in assessing if the dropout rate for their high school students is less than the national level of 10%. So testing for our null hypothesis, as um, our proportion is equal to 10% versus our alternative, what they're actually testing for if their proportion is less than 10% at our 5% significance. So a large random sample of high school students from the district was selected, and the sample proportion that dropped out was given as our p hat equal to 0.12. So without performing any calculations, what would be your decision for this hypothesis test? and also give a brief explanation as to why. So think about this problem for a little bit. It might, it might take a little bit to
kind of wrap your head around it. But again, we don't really need to make any calculations. We just kind of need to think about, given our sample proportion and how that is related to our hypothesis test, what could be our what could be our outward decision? So in this case, we would say that we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. And that is because our sample proportion is actually ending up in the opposite direction of our alternative hypothesis. So remember that what we're trying to test for is to see if our proportion is less than 10%. But then when we actually gathered our sample, we actually ended up getting 12%, which ends up actually being greater than. So because of this, um, if we were to plot this distribution and find a p-value, we, would, um, we wouldn't we would know exactly what the p-value is just given this information, but we can see that the p-value should definitely be greater than 50%, right, as it takes up over half the graph. So as we see within this um, distribution I provided, that would mean like if we were to work through this hypothesis test and find a certain test statistic, that would end up giving us like a positive test statistic, right? And if we plot it positive, that means we plot it to the right of our mean. And then um, since we are shading in the direction of the alternative hypothesis, we would be shading to the left of this positive test statistic. And we see in doing that, that the area to the left of that test statistic ends up taking up more than 50% of the graph, which gives us that p-value of greater than 50%. So even though we don't know exactly what the p-value is, we do know for sure it's greater than 50%, so we have to fail to reject this null hypothesis. All right, so let's take a look at this last problem. We have blood battle as an annual blood drive competition between Ohio State and the University of Michigan. A group of statistics students surveyed a random sample of 200 UM students of which 80 of them, or 40%, said they plan on donating blood. And we also have another random sample of 150 OSU students resulted in 48, or 32%, saying they plan on donating blood. A 90% confidence interval for the difference in the population proportion of all UM students who plan on donating blood, minus the population proportion of all OSU students who plan on donating blood, is given by this interval that is in between negative 0 0.005 and positive 0.165. So a group of statistics students provides you with two claims. For each of the two claims, determine if these statements are appropriate or not. And if the statement is incorrect, provide a brief explanation as to why. So let's take a look at this first statement we have. So because the 90% confidence interval is almost entirely positive, we can suggest that the population proportion of all UM students who plan on donating blood is significantly higher than the population proportion of all U OSU students who plan on donating blood. So think about this problem, think if this is an accurate statement or not. So for this one, we would say that this is actually an incorrect statement. So given this confidence interval, we would say that it gives us a range of reasonable values for our parameter, in which case this parameter is our true difference in our two population proportions. Um, so if we re look back at this confidence interval of negative 0.005 to positive 0.165, we see that although a, a lot of that interval falls above zero, not the whole thing does. There's the slightest part of this interval that falls below zero. So because of that, there is still a chance that this difference could be negative, right? In which case, that would mean that in that case that the OSU student proportion is actually greater than. So because of that slight chance, we, um, we can't conclude that the true difference is greater than zero. Um, so to be able to conclude that, we would need this full interval to be above zero. But because of how a little bit is below, we can't say that for sure. All right, now let's take a look at the second statement. The assumptions necessary for constructing a confidence interval for the difference in population proportions are that each sample is randomly selected, the samples are independent from one another, and the population of differences follows a normal distribution. So does this sound right to you or not?
So for this, we'd actually say it's also incorrect. So given these assumptions, the first two that we have, that um, random and independence, those are correct. But this last assumption for a normal distribution, we wouldn't say that that is correct. Um, so since, and that's because we're working with our proportion, which is um, given as our categorical data. So we can't say that that's actually normally distributed. So instead of this, we would need to perform our sample size check. So remembering back at our proportion testing and making our proportion confidence intervals, we need um, to have that sample size check, make sure that we have 10 successes and 10 failures to have that large enough sample size to conclude that the distribution of our possible differences is approximately normal. So that last assumption we need is that large enough sample size in this case. Um, and again, um, worksheet two will help with remembering all these assumptions for all the tests that we've been working through. So that'll be really helpful in getting um, all these different assumptions situated in your brain. All right, so that does it with our lab review questions. Next, we can take a look at this lab ticket that is also just more exam review problems. So take a look at this. You can work through the whole thing or just work on it one by one throughout um, with the video if you'd like to, however you want to do it. So we'll go ahead and get started in just a second. So let's take a look at the first question. So I have a study from 2018 reported that 16% of all U.S. adults age 50 plus use Instagram regularly. A researcher wishes to evaluate if this rate has decreased from, for all U.S. adults in 2019. They collect a random sample of 20 adults and find that two of them, or 10%, use Instagram regularly. What is the symbol and value of the test statistic, and what distribution would be used to find the p-value? So think about this. All right, so for this, um, here we are working with categorical data and counting the number of U.S. adults who use Instagram regularly. So since it's categorical data, we have these U.S. adults, they either do or don't use Instagram regularly, so it's a yes or no type question. That's why it's categorical. So we're, we're working with this random of, um, working with this random sample of 20 U.S. adults, um, we want to um, run a hypothesis test, um, and we know that because of our keyword that we are given to evaluate if our population proportion has decreased from 2018. So, and given this information, we can set up how our hypotheses would look in this sort of test. Our null hypothesis is that our proportion is still the same at 16% versus our alternative. What we're trying to test for is if this proportion is less than 16% for 2019. So remember, whenever we are running a proportion test, we have to work through our assumptions to know what test statistic we need to use. Namely, um, working at this assumption for sample size. So if we have that large enough sample, we can approximate to normal and use a Z statistic. Or if it's not big enough, then we would have to go to a binomial. So in this case, we could check for the sample size. Remember, we would use our sample size, multiply it by our null proportion. In this case, our 20 times um, 16, as well as our n, our n sample size multiplied by 1 minus that null proportion. So 20 times 0.16 and 20 times 0.84. We see that in one of these cases, we actually don't get that large enough sample. So remember, in both cases, they need to be greater than or equal to 10. But in this first check, we actually see that that's not the case because we only get 3.2. So we would say that the sample size is not large enough to do this normal approximation and use a z-score. And because of that, we would have to fall back on our small sample binomial test. And so now that we know that we're running a binomial test, we could find our test statistic, which is given as our count variable x. And that is given as our two US adults, um, as there was two out of the 20 in the sample that we found to use Instagram. So that is our test statistic we're given. And then the distribution that we want to use is that binomial, since it's a binomial test. And we can input our parameters. Remember, our parameters for the binomial is our n number of trials, p probability of success. In this case, our trials is our sample size of 20. And our probability of success 
is the percentage of U.S. adults who use Instagram, which was hypothesized at 0.16. All right, now let's take a look at the second question on the ticket. So we have a UM student would like to assess if Stats 250 students perform significantly better on exam one than exam two. A random sample of Stats 250 students will be taken and their differences in scores will be computed. In addition to needing a random sample of differences, one more assumption is needed to perform this test. Um, the UM student makes the following claim, is it appropriate or not? And explain why. So a claim given the population mean difference in exam scores is normally distributed. So think about this claim. Do you think it's right or not? So in this case, you'd actually say that this statement is not appropriate. So remember, within this statement, it's saying the population mean difference in exam scores is normally distributed. So remember, namely, population mean difference. That's just one number. So our mean is just one number. Um, and we would say that one number does not have a certain distribution. So our mean could be part of a distribution, but the mean itself is, um, does not have a distribution, uh, as it's just that one number. So because of this, we would want to change the statement slightly to make it correct. So instead of saying that the mean is normally distributed, we would want that the whole population, so our population of differences in exam scores is normally distributed. This would be what we'd want to change it to to make this a correct assumption. All right, now let's take a look at this third question. A newspaper states that 70% of all college students skip class at least once a week. A group of students decide to check this claim and compute a 95% confidence interval for the population proportion of all college students who skip class at least once a week, which they found to be between 0.48 and 0.64. Using a significance level of 10%, can the students conclude the population proportion is significantly different from 0.7? Briefly explain. So think about this. Given this um, confidence interval um, that has a 95% level, now we want to use a significance level of 10%. How would that shift our certain interval? So in this case, um, we would still reject the null hypothesis and conclude there is sufficient evidence to suggest that the population proportion of all college students who skip class at least once a week differs from 70%. So we, the reasoning for this, um, if we use this original interval from 0.48 to 0.64, um, we can test this hypothesis with a 5% significance, right? Because the original interval was 95% confidence level which corresponds to our 5% significance level. Um, so because of this, um, in this case, we, would, we could reject the null hypothesis because our test value of 0 0.7 falls outside of the interval. So because 0.7 is outside of our interval of 0.48 to 0.64, um, we would say that that's not a very viable option as we have provided. And we could also see that within this visualization provided below. Um, so to alter our interval to match the 10% significance level, though, we would need to examine a 90% confidence interval. And given our differences between our confidence levels and how they shift our intervals, remember that whenever we are getting a lower confidence level, that in turn will make our confidence interval narrower. So in this case, we are going from a 95% confidence level to a 90%. So since we're going smaller, that means that our resulting 90% interval should be narrower than our original 0.48 to 0.64. So because of this, as we see, this interval is getting narrower. And we don't know how narrow it's going to get. But we do know that no matter how narrow it gets, this um, our test value of 70% still won't fall inside of it, right? As it's getting smaller, 0.7 was already outside of the interval. So there's no way that 0.7 will be in the interval after this narrowing of the interval. So in this case, we can still reject the null hypothesis of 70% given this 90% interval. I hope that made sense the way I described it. It makes a lot more sense if you look at this visualization provided.
All right, so now let's take a look at the last problem for this ticket. To have a standardized test is known to have a true mean of 70 points and a true standard deviation of 10 points. A random sample of 100 scores will be selected and the average will be calculated. What is the probability that the average score from the sample of 100 will be at least 72 points? So think about it. This one might take a little bit when you're done. Let's take a look at it together. All right, so starting off with this, um, we should start off by listing what we know. So for our original population, we know the true mean was given to be 70 points, so our mean mu of 70. We have our true standard deviation as well, given as 10 points, and we have this random sample of 100. But we see here that we don't really have any information of the shape of this graph. We don't know what type of distribution it follows, so we can't really say for sure what type that is. Um, but instead, because of um, we are interested in finding the, instead of the finding any particular um, individual observation, any particular score being greater than a certain amount of points, what we're interested in finding is um, this probability of our average score within our random sample being greater than or equal to 72 points. So because of that provided information that we're trying to find this certain mean, uh, we, that means we have to figure out the distribution of sample means and then find the probability associated with that. So given that we're working with this distribution of sample means, that should be our clue in that we need to apply that central limit theorem. Again, since we have this large sample size of 100, which is greater than 25, we can use that. So we know that our distribution of sample means will look like this. Um, and because of that, because given the central limit theorem, we could say that our mean is our original mean of 70. We can take that standard deviation to be our original standard deviation over the square root of our sample size. So 10 over the square root of 100 would give us that standard deviation of 1. So this would be our certain distribution of sample means. But alternatively, we could calculate our corresponding test statistic for this sample mean of interest and get our standard normal distribution for this sample mean. Um, so since we know the standard deviation for the population, we could calculate this test statistic. So remember using this formula to find the z, this x bar minus mu over the standard deviation of square root n. This, plugging in all these numbers should give us that z score of 2, and we could plot that within our standard normal distribution. Remember, standard normal distribution just means it's normal with our mean of 0, standard deviation of 1. So in this case, we say that both distributions would be acceptable because we don't specifically ask to draw the sampling distribution or the test statistic distribution. So either of these distributions will work. But we would say that a t distribution would be inappropriate because we are provided with that population standard deviation. And remember, we only use the t-distribution if we don't know what that population standard deviation is. So given these distributions, we could find our resulting p-value to be um, exactly 0 0.0228. Or if you decide to use the empirical rule, since this is a more exact standard deviation away, it's like exactly 2 away from our mean, we could use that empirical rule and say that it's roughly 2.5%. All right, so that does it with this review lab. Um, thanks for watching. Um, just um, remember, since this is an exam week, there's not any other work that you guys have to turn in this week. The next thing you'll have to worry about is the pre-lab that's due the Monday after the exam. But in terms of work you have to do this week, you just have to make sure that you're studying and prepping for this exam. Um, make sure if you have any questions, reach out to the instructor team, to your GSI. Um, Make sure you check out that live stream lab as well if you have any questions on anything that we just went over. And if nothing else, good luck on the exam.